Please be seated. We're going to begin our service as we normally do in prayer, so let us just have a time of quiet and let us pray together. Yes, Lord, as we sang that hymn, let there be light. We come and gather to worship this morning, each from our very own different circumstances and experience. Each of us comes with our own expectations and hopes. Each of us comes with our own beliefs and understanding. But we come, we gather together to worship God and to hear what he has to say to us today. Whatever darkness fills our lives, whatever clouds of misery surround us, whatever despair fills our hearts, we pray today that as we worship, God's light will shine in our lives and dispel the darkness and awaken us to new possibilities and to the new life God calls each of us to lead. We gather together to share and give thanks for Hallie as we welcome her through baptism. We pray that God's light will shine into her life. We gather together on this Sunday, which is Bible Sunday, as we hear the words of the Bible today, we pray that our eyes may be opened and God's light will shine into each of our lives. So let us worship now, putting aside all that has been and looking forward to all that will be. Let us open ourselves to receive the light of God and to be filled with light and love and life and let us go from this place into the communities in which we live and take with us that light to share with those we meet this week. Amen. Today, many churches around the country will be celebrating Bible Sunday, a Sunday organised by the Bible Society to celebrate uh, God's Word in the Bible that is used around the world today uh, by billions of people as they worship. I'm going to read to you some facts about the Bible, and I want you to put your thumb up if you already knew what, I'm, what I've said, or thumbs down if you didn't know what I've said, okay? So the first fact is, the Bible is made up of a lot of books, 66 books in total, um, and it's put together in just one book. And thumbs up if you knew that already. Thumbs down if it's not. Good. The Bible is broken into two parts. The Old Testament, what happened before Jesus was born. And the New Testament, what happened after Jesus was born. Thumbs up if you knew that. Thumbs down if you didn't. Soup, thumb up. The Bible is the best-selling book in the world every year. Thumb up if you think. Yeah? Great. And if you didn't know that, thumb up. The Bible was written by about 40 different people. Did you know that? Okay. There are more than 185 songs in the Bible. Some people didn't know that. Okay. The Bible has been translated into 700 languages. Do you know? 700 languages? Yeah. There are 7,000 languages in the world. The Bible has been translated into 700. Part of the work of the Bible Society is to keep bringing out new translations so different communities can read the Bible, God's Word for themselves in their own language. Um, so, 700 languages. Um, as we come to celebrate baptism today, we will be reminded uh, in the promises that Robbie and Sam will make today just how important it is for parents to guide their children as they grow up. And we don't think about how the Bible guides us as we grow in faith and uh, as we go, go throughout life. As parents, we guide our children in a variety of ways. Uh, we set rules for them. Uh, we affirm them in what they're doing and we comfort them. 
Um, I want to ask some of the children here, what are some of the things that your parents are always saying to you? Can you think of something your parents are always saying to you? People like to share what that might be. No? Tidy the room. I'm, I'm, I'm pre-prepared, so don't worry. So, you know, uh, if, you're, if you're a bit embarrassed about saying, uh, how, many, how many of you have heard your parents shout, dinner time? <laughs> yeah? My boys hate it. My boys hate it when we say dinner time because they're always in the middle of something. Uh, whether it's a, a video or playing on the Xbox with somebody, they're always in the middle of something. So I dread shouting dinner time because I know I'm just going to get this oh. dinner time. It's one of the things that we say as parents. Time for school. Your parents shout that in the morning. Time for school. It means you've got to rush and put your socks on and get your coat and your sandwich box and your uh, yeah, school bag. Time for school. I love food. Your parents say that to you? I love food. We perhaps don't say that enough in our families. Time to tidy up. Playtime's over. You've had your fun. Now, put everything on. Eat your vegetables. Eat your vegetables. Have, you have the things that you like, now you've got to eat that. The bits, the hearts, the vegetables. It will all be okay. How many times have your parents said that to you? Something terrible has ha happened, totally tragic, totally devastating. And yet your parents say to you, don't worry, it will all be okay. You can do this. Yeah? The encouragement. Especially when we're younger, when, uh, when, we're, when we're hands age, uh, when we're trying to walk, when we're trying to talk, when we struggle with just doing things we need to do in life. Our parents, uh, the ones who look after us, are the ones who normally say, you can do this. Go on, give it a go. We're here for you. You can do this. And I believe in you. Yeah, when everybody else has kind of disregarded us, when everybody else has kind of turned away from us, uh, perhaps our parents and the ones who look after us are the ones who say, I believe in you. No matter what everybody else thinks, I still believe in you. Um, our parents uh, and those who bring us up and look after us, uh, they're important to us because they teach, they guide, they help, and they comfort us. And God has words to do the same for us in the Bible. God's word, God speaks to us in the Bible. When we read the Bible, we get guidance and help and comfort from God. Now, God didn't pick up the pen and paper and just write the Bible. Instead, God inspired people who trusted and believed in him to write it all down. And that's what we have in the Bible today. And as we read and learn what is in the Bible, we find out what God has to say to us. Perhaps God says to us, it's dinner time. You need to look after yourself. You need to do the physical things you need to do to help you carry on. You need to look after yourself. It's time for school. You've had your play. Now you've got to learn something. Okay? Now you've got to be school. Time for school. I love you. Some people say the Bible is just a long love letter from God to each of us. God says in the Bible, I love you. Every one of us, God says, I love you. <laughs> Time to tidy up. Time to stop making a mess. And to start putting things right. You may have made a mess in your life so far, but now's the time to start tidying up. Sort yourself out. Eat your vegetables. There's some good advice in the Bible for us on how to live a good and healthy life. 
Some of it's clouded in a lot of rules and regulations, but in there, if we look, there's good advice for us that we perhaps don't want to hear, but actually is, is good advice. It will all be okay. Words of comfort in the Bible when God says to us, doesn't matter what's going on. Just trust me. It will all be okay. You can do this. You've got it. I made you, God says. I made you. I know exactly what you're going for. I know exactly what to achieve. You can do this because I know you better than you know yourself. And the Bible isn't about perhaps us believing in God, but about hearing that God believes in us. God believes that we are good people. God believes that we can be uh, a better version of ourselves. Um, and we can read that in the Bible. So today, as we celebrate uh, baptism and Halloween, we also celebrate Bible Sunday. And God's word that comes to us to help us and to comfort us and to teach us. And so we give thanks for that today as we go through our worship. But we're going to sing uh, again. We're going to sing number 321 in the hymn books that talks about the words of God that we find in the Bible. It says, your words to me are life and health. So let's stand. If you want to sing, then please put your mask on as we sing 321. Your words to me are life and health. Cheer up, they said. Get up, he is calling you. 
and threw off his cloak, jumped up, and came to Jesus. What do you want me to do for you? Jesus asked him. Teacher, the blind man answered, I want to see again. Go, Jesus told him, your faith has made you well. At once he was able to see and followed Jesus on the road. Amen. Thank you, Helen. It seems a simple passage to understand, doesn't it? There's a blind man on the road. He asks Jesus to cure his blindness, and Jesus does. That's basically that entire passage in just a few words. But like so many things in life, we listen, but we don't really hear. We look and don't really see. And what I want to do is just to allow us to spend some moments now as I would encourage you to do whenever you read the Bible, to just reflect on the word so that we might understand the deeper meaning behind it. Like Bartimaeus in the story, we come to Jesus and we ask him to open our eyes so that we might see properly that what is in God's word for us today. Arthur is 75 years old. He played golf every day since his retirement 15 years ago. And one day, he arrives home in a terrible rage. He throws his golf clubs on the floor and he says, that's it, to his wife. I'm giving up golf. My eyesight has become so bad that once I hit the ball, I couldn't see where it went. His wife sympathizes and makes him a cup of tea. And as they sit down, she says, why don't you take my brother with you and give it one more try? That's no good, sighed Arthur. Your brother is 85. He can't. He may be 85, says the wife, but his eyesight is perfect. So the next day, Arthur heads off to the golf club with his brother-in-law. He tees up, he takes a mighty swing, and he squints down the fairway, he turns to his brother-in-law and says, Did you see the ball? <coughs> of course I did, answers the brother-in-law. I have perfect eyesight. Where did it go, Arthur asks. I don't remember. <laughs> <laughs> we all here, I guess, have taken a swing at life. We've given it our all. But it can seem sometimes that the way ahead, the destination we're trying to reach, is unclear. I guess the question for us this morning is, is the way ahead unclear because we can't see properly, or is it because we've forgotten? We're all on a journey. We celebrate today that Harry has begun a journey of faith, which we hope and pray she will continue as she grows. And with the help and support of her family and friends, she might be able to see clearly the path ahead and be guided in the right direction. But all of us are on a journey of faith. We're all trying to find how to be the best version of ourselves. A faith journey. We're trying to find the meaning of life or discover more about God and the reason for our existence. It's interesting that the passage this morning, the healing of blind Bartimaeus, is set around a journey. It's set around a physical journey, as Jesus and the disciples travel from Jericho to Jerusalem, but it's also a spiritual journey, a faith journey, as the disciples follow Jesus to the cross and a deeper understanding of who Jesus really is. The passage that we just read comes at the end of a section of Mark's Gospel. A section that begins with Jesus healing a blind man in Bethsaida and it ends with the healing of blind Bartimaeus. And these two passages about healing of blind men sandwich a whole chunk of teaching where Jesus tries to open the eyes of the disciples to who he really is. There are a number of times within that section where Jesus says to the disciples, 
Who do people say I am? And he asked the disciples what their response was. There's the transfiguration of Jesus, where Jesus takes three of his closest disciples up a mountain and shows them very clearly who he is. This whole section of Mark's Gospel, where Jesus heals people's physical blindness, also talks about how to heal their spiritual blindness so that they can see clearly who Jesus is and where they are heading on their journey of faith. But this passage is also a physical journey. The disciples have travelled from Bethsaida on the north side of the Sea of Galilee to Jericho, some 80 miles to the south. And in the reading today, Jesus and the disciples are leaving Jericho to head for Jerusalem, some 15 miles to the west, and facing a steep climb through the wilderness on the last leg of their journey. The passage that immediately follows the reading we have is the Palm Sunday passage, when Jesus and the disciples arrive in Jerusalem, and Jesus rides on the donkey at the beginning of the week leading up to his day. But what about Bartimaeus? There are three things I want to say about what we learn of Bartimaeus in this passage. The first thing is that Bartimaeus was not on a journey. In fact, Mark makes it quite clear because he tells us that Bartimaeus was sitting by the roadside. He wasn't even on the road. He was sitting beside the road. But Mark doesn't use the road, word for road because there wasn't really a word for road in Mark's day. The word Mark uses is the way. Bartimaeus was sat beside the way. And that has significance because Jesus tells his disciples when they ask about which direction they are heading, Jesus says to them, I am the way. Bartimaeus is physically sitting beside the road, but Mark wants us to know that Bartimaeus was not on the way, but beside the way. So when Bartimaeus is healed, his journey of faith begins and he follows Jesus, and Mark says at the end of the passage, immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus along the road. He followed him on the way. When Jesus called the disciples originally, they left everything and followed him. When we see clearly who Jesus is, our immediate response is to follow him, to follow the way. We might be minding our own business, sitting beside the road, not having any thoughts about a spiritual journey. But when we see clearly who Jesus is, our immediate response is to follow him. This is a passage about journeying and about seeing clearly who Jesus was, who is the way, and calls us to follow him. The second is about blindness in the passage. Jesus has been asking the disciples, who do you think I am? And their responses were, you are a prophet, you are Elijah. But Peter responded and said, you are the Messiah. You are the one who has been foretold will come and save the nation of Israel from oppression by the Romans. And in all these responses, we see that the disciples do not really see who Jesus was. When Jesus tells them that the Messiah came to die at the hands of the Romans, Peter himself tells Jesus that he's just talking rubbish. They have been following Jesus all this time, but they can't see clearly who Jesus really is. They are spiritually blind. And yet when Bartimaeus heard that Jesus was coming, he shouted, Jesus, son of David, have pity on me. The Jews believed the Messiah would be a descendant of David. Bartimaeus shouts out twice, Son of David, have pity on me. The disciples couldn't see who Jesus was. But Bartimaeus, who was blind, had no problem seeing the truth. And the crowd's reaction is to tell Bartimaeus to shut up. 
Perhaps because to be shouting about the Messiah, who the Jews were hoping would overthrow the Romans, was politically a dangerous thing to be doing. The crowds can't see for themselves the truth of what Bartimaeus is saying. It seems everyone in the passage can't really see who Jesus is apart from blind Bartimaeus. And after the disciples of Jesus arrive in Jerusalem in the next passage, it's the crowds themselves, when Jesus enters Jerusalem, that are shouting, Hosanna to the Son of David! But here in Jericho, they're telling Bartimaeus to keep quiet because they are blind to what is happening. And then the third thing I want to say about Bartimaeus is that when Jesus calls him over, he throws off his coat, jumps up, and runs to Jesus. The disciples have been walking for 80 miles, and they're now on a 15 mile climb from Jericho to Jerusalem in the hot desert sun. You can imagine they are tired and weary and have little energy. But Bartimaeus jumps up and runs to Jesus. He throws off his coat. Imagine that. Bartimaeus is a beggar. He would have very few possessions. In the desert it would be cold at night. It would be freezing even. And yet Bartimaeus throws off his coat and leaves it behind to go to Jesus. When Jesus calls, our response should be that of Bartimaeus. We should throw off the past, free ourselves of all that has been, so that we might be as enthusiastic as Bartimaeus in our response to Jesus. At the beginning of our faith journeys, we might have had a bit more energy than perhaps we do now. Perhaps we feel like the disciples facing that uphill slog. Perhaps our feet are trudging as we move forward. Just this very simple passage, just these seven verses, have such depth. That's why we celebrate Bible Sunday and God's Word today. The question it asks of us is, do you see clearly the way ahead? Do you see clearly the way? Jesus, who is the way, the truth, and the life. And if not, is it because your spiritual eyesight is so bad that you can't see? Are you sitting beside the road, just letting life pass you by without seeing clearly any way forward? If it is, then know that Jesus calls you and asks you, what do you want me to do for you? And I invite you to ask the same thing that Bartimaeus did. Master, I want to see. Or is it because you have forgotten what you once knew was true? Has the initial energy and enthusiasm for your faith worn off like the disciples on their way to Jerusalem? Are you weary and dragging your feet? Then know that Jesus calls you again and again and again to follow him. And may we be ready to throw off all that hampers us and to jump and run forward and follow Jesus as we continue on the journey. Thanks be to God for his word. Amen. We're going to come to a time of prayer where we pray for ourselves and the world around us. As we do, we do invite you to sing again. So please stand. We're going to sing 92 Amazing Grace. Let's stand and sing 92 together.
you for all the blessings that you shower upon our lives. We come now and offer to you these gifts of money and the gift of ourselves that you may bless these gifts and use them in your service so others may come to know of your love for them. Please be seated. We're going to, before we come to the end of the service, we're just going to pray together. Um, and in the prayer, I'm going to invite you to make a response. Um, when I say the words, what do you want God to do for you? The response is, Lord, we want to sin. Okay? What do you want God to do for you? Lord, we want to see. So I'm right, just to join that response. <laughs> At the end of the prayer, we're going to say the Lord's Prayer together. If you're not sure of the words, then just on the back cover of the hymn book, the traditional form of the Lord's Prayer, which we'll be using. So let us pray together. Let's pray. As children of our Heavenly Father, trusting in His will and capacity to care for us all, let us pray. We pray for all those who offer care and love in the church, for the ministries of listening and counselling, the sharing of grief, the freeing from guilt. We pray for the grace to accompany others to Christ's healing love. What do you want God to do for you? Lord, we want to see. We pray for the healing of the nations, for a recognition of our need of God and a turning away from all that is evil. We pray for all in authority and worldly power that they may be guided along the right paths. What do you want God to do for you? Lord, we want to see. We pray for an increase in love for one another. That we may be better at recognising needs and responding to them. That we may give more time to those that we love. What do you want God to do for you? Lord, we want to see. We pray for those who are blind or partially sighted and those who are spiritually or emotionally blind. We pray for the opening of eyes to see God's way and faith to trust in Him through good and bad. What do you want God to do for you? Lord, we want to see. We pray for those whose eyes have shut to this world, that they may be open to the brightness and joy of heaven. What do you want God to do for you? Lord, we want to see. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for drawing us to you and stretching out your arms to us in welcome and in love. We pray in the name of Jesus Christ, who taught us to say together the words of the Lord. <laughs> Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass us. And lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. We want to stand one more time for our final hymn, number 319 in the books. Thanks to God, whose word was spoken. Hymn number 300.
blessing on Ali and her family and on all of us today. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. May the blessing of God all night, Father, Son and Holy Spirit be with you all today and for all the days to come. Thank you.